because we'll we'll rely on that today. Good. So I think we'll. Not ready. We'll get started then. And uh, today uh, we're, as, as uh, we started last Friday, we're shifting uh, for a couple of weeks to uh, macroeconomics. Uh, and uh, macroeconomics is a look at the economy as a whole in the aggregate uh, and key indicators of aggregate or average performance of the economy. And this week we're talking about long-term macroeconomics, uh, especially long-term uh, growth of the economy. And next week we're talking about short-term macroeconomics, uh, shocks to the economy and business cycles, financial crises, COVID and uh, what uh, short-term shocks uh, do to uh, the macro economy. So today is uh, really uh, our opportunity to discuss long-term economic development and long-term economic growth. And I will uh, share the screen and uh, we'll uh, take a, an overview in uh, one hour uh, of a topic that I find to be uh, among the most fascinating and important topics uh, of economics, uh, and that is the nature of long-term change of economies and the reasons for differences across the world in patterns of long-term change. So uh, this is macroeconomics in the long term. And once again, macroeconomics is the study of the economy as a whole, and, and typically at the scale of a nation uh, or the world uh, treated as a single interconnected economy. It's therefore concerned with aggregates, adding together the parts of an economy uh, and with economy-wide averages that describe the state of the economy in useful ways. So the kinds of aggregates that macroeconomics deals with include output, and you started with the national accounts, which is a measure of the aggregate output of an economy, the production of goods and services in an economy during a given period of time, typically a year, population, labor, or that is uh, workers in the economy, different from population, which also includes children and uh, retired people. Uh, capital, which is the sum of the long-lived productive assets of an economy, such as the machinery, the buildings, the roads, uh, the power uh, generation and transmission, and so on. The land, especially land used for economic activities such as crop production or forestry. Technology somehow defined in an aggregate way and uh, economics has come up with methods of summarizing the level of technology in an economy as the total factor productivity. Production by major sectors of the economy. <coughs> for example, the primary, secondary, and tertiary sectors of the economy, and the distribution of the population between urban and rural areas. And we're also interested in averages. <clears throat> and the most important average that we look at typically as a single uh, summary statistic of an economy is the output per person or the GDP per capita, because it turns out that single number is quite informative not of the happiness and well-being of the population, but of uh, many of the attributes of an economy. And it is strongly related to many other uh, measures that we're interested in, uh, like life expectancy uh, or uh, other uh, indicators of well-being. Uh, we're interested in the proportions of output and work 
according to the major sectors of the economy, we're interested in the percent of the population that's urban versus rural and so forth. So this is the topic of macroeconomics. I have to say, I fell in love with the subject uh, 48 years ago <laughs> and have uh, been a macroeconomist uh, since then, because I like the idea that we can take a, a, an overview of a society or take a, a sense of uh, the uh, overall performance of an economy. So today we're talking about long-term macroeconomics, which is concerned with the levels and changes of these aggregates and averages over long periods of time, typically over the course of generations or centuries. Whereas <laughs> macroeconomics in the short term is concerned with the levels and changes of the aggregates and averages over a few years, typically in the range of one to five years, the length of a business cycle, uh, the period from a boom to a bust, for example, is a few years, whereas the structural change of an economy from a rural to an urban economy is perhaps a half century or a century long. So what are the major questions <clears throat> that long-term macroeconomics uh, seeks to address? Uh, first, what determines the level and the change uh, of output and output per capita in the economy over the course of generations? What determines the persistent differences of GDP per capita across countries and across regions of the world? Why are certain regions uh, with high output per person and other regions with low output per person with those differences persisting over the course of decades or even centuries? What determines the growth of population, where the population is employed, which sectors? where the population lives, whether urban or rural. We've discussed some of that previously. What policies are conducive to raising output per person? Because we think that output per person is at least related to living standards, uh, the material quality of life. And Adam Smith in writing The Wealth of Nations was interested in this question what public policies are conducive to producing a high level of output per person or uh, relatedly the incomes per person of the population. When we take the long, long view in the most aggregate way, we learn something extremely important and basic about macroeconomics. This is uh, an attempt by uh, a uh, late uh, macroeconomic historian, Angus Madison of the Netherlands, to construct the output and population accounts of countries over the very long period, uh, roughly from 1 AD to the present. It was a monumental effort of one economist. His efforts have been built on since then, but his basic findings uh, have been confirmed repeatedly by attempts to look at long-term changes of output per capita. You can imagine how hard it is to compare an aggregate over long periods of time because what's produced in an economy and how people live change fundamentally. So one should take with some uh, a little bit of skepticism uh, and uh, margin for uh, uh, literary license, these uh, specific numbers. But the basic points are correct, I believe, in looking at output per capita over these 2000 years from 1 AD to 2008. And what you see in this picture is that output per capita was quite low by the uh, measure used here, measured in 
1990 prices. Uh, so uh, now in 2020, uh, prices have, are probably 40% uh, higher than what you see here. So you might multiply by 1.4 to get today's uh, estimates uh, in 2020 dollars. But these are 1990 dollars and they show that per capita income worldwide was very low and uh, not changing very much for 1800 years, uh, roughly from uh, 1 AD at, at the uh, time of uh, near the beginning of the Roman Empire up until today, uh, for the first 1800 years worldwide, very little change of output per person. And then starting around 1800, this curve turns steeply upward so that uh, output per capita rises roughly 10 times or even more between 1800 and uh, today on a worldwide average. So something changes decisively in the pattern of long-term macroeconomics around 1800, around 200 years ago. And this uh, modern period is called the period of modern economic growth. And it's sometime dated to 1750 or to 1800. But the idea is that the rise of output per capita worldwide is a modern event. Uh, it's roughly 200 to 250 years uh, old, and it's clearly associated with industrialization. So the takeoff of economic growth, that is of the persistent rise of output per capita at a rapid rate, is associated with the rise of industry. And this is a major basic point about long-term economic change. It was extremely gradual throughout most of human history, ups and downs, cycles, empires rising, empires falling, but the average uh, nature of the economy not changing very much because during that first 1800 years, almost everybody uh, lived as peasant farmers. A few lived as uh, landed uh, aristocracy. Uh, some lived as slaves, uh, but everybody uh, nearly in the society was tied to agriculture uh, and uh, agricultural production was uh, enough to uh, keep near subsistence, but not much higher. And that pattern of life, overwhelmingly rural, overwhelmingly near subsistence, persisted over uh, 1800 years shown here, uh, and only changed with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. If one graphs the estimates of the human population, it's a similar picture. Uh, the human population remained uh, in the tens of millions of people uh, from uh, prehistory uh, up until a few hundred million people on the planet at the time of uh, the Roman Empire, but well below a billion people until around 1800. And then together with industrialization, the population of the world soared. Uh, today, we are at 7.8 billion people and the world population is expected to reach around 10 billion by mid century. So just as output per person increased by roughly a factor 10 from 1800 until today, the population also increased by roughly a factor 10 
during the same period, since the total output of the world economy is equal to the output per person times the number of people, and since the output per person increased roughly tenfold and the number of people increased roughly tenfold, the total output of the world economy increased by roughly 100 times during the past 200 or so years. So again, the basic fact of long-term macroeconomics is uh, a long period of uh, ups and downs without major long-term change followed by a dramatic uh, inflection point uh, at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, and suddenly a dramatic change of the world demography like the change of the world economy. And this is yet one more picture that is uh, uh, also a measure of macroeconomic structural change. This is an estimate of the proportion of the world's population living in urban areas. That is a term that needs uh, definition, but generally think of an urban area as any human settlement that is uh, relatively densely settled with at least a few thousand people. Uh, so a village or a town uh, that has, uh, by some definitions, at least 2,000 people, by other definitions, at least 5,000 people. The proportion of the world living in urban areas was well below 10% for most of human history. And it's now only reached more than half of the world's population in the 21st century. And the current estimate is roughly 55% urbanization today on a trajectory to reach around 70% of the world living in urban areas as of mid century. But you see the same telltale uh, curve that is very gradual change. In this case, you can see the curve starts to turn up around uh, 1200 AD with the uh, emergence of more cities in Europe. Uh, and uh, the Netherlands is a precocious urbanizing country. And Britain is a precocious urbanizing country reaching 30 or 40 percent urban during the 18th century. But most of the world is still living on or near farms in rural areas, living near subsistence until industrialization begins uh, in the middle of the 18th century. So from all points of view, uh, long-term macroeconomics can rightly be summarized as two phases pre-1800 and post-1800. Before 1800, <clears throat> everything changed slowly and in long-term waves of ups and downs, but not all tending in one direction. After 1800, we have been on a dramatic acceleration of economic output, of economic output per capita, and of the world's population uh, moving to urban areas or rural areas becoming sufficiently densely settled and with more jobs in secondary and tertiary sectors, that is in industry and services rather than agriculture and mining, so that those formerly rural areas became urban areas. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. All theories of long term economic change, all theories of the rise of output per person, 
essentially are based on the idea of improved technological know-how. So all theories of rising output per capita over any stretch of time are really knowledge-based theories of long-term economic change that societies learn to do things better. They learn to grow more food per hectare of land. They learn to mine more minerals or to smelt the ores uh, into metals or to fashion the metals into more useful alloys uh, or to uh, devise new methods of transportation or new methods of communication or new methods of trade and finance. Uh, so that the core driver of long-term change is what we call technological advancement. And I think that that's a good starting point for us. There are three visions of what happens after a rise of technology that are important to understand. Uh, they have different levels of uh, optimism uh, or pessimism about the consequences of a rise of technological know-how. The first idea is due to Thomas Robert Malthus, who wrote about this idea at the very end of the 18th century uh, when he wrote about the principles of population, uh, and Malthus became famous for his pessimism. Malthus's idea is that higher technology temporarily leads to higher output per person. That higher output per person leads to better human survival because people are better fed and they're healthier as a result of higher living standards. But that higher survival rate leads to a growth of the population. And because the amount of arable land is fixed, a higher population means less arable land per person. And as the population grows, the uh, lower amounts of land available to grow food for the expanding population reverse the increase of GDP per capita and end up uh, leading to uh, the GDP per capita going back down to subsistence levels. So in Malthus's model, which he described actually in a numerical way in 1798, his idea is that a rise of technology, and he had in mind, for example, better ways to produce food, in the end would not raise output per person, but would rather just increase the population. Because as long as the population was living above subsistence levels, the population would tend to grow, and the rise of the population would tend to push down living standards until subsistence was reached again. So Malthus was the true pessimist. He said, uh, even if we improve technology, we will not improve living conditions. And in a way, he looked back to this picture, uh, which he didn't know numerically, but he intuited that there have not been persistent changes of output per capita in history. And he surmised that that was because a rise of know-how would end up not as a rise of output per person, but rather as a rise of population without a gain of living standards. Note that Malthus wrote in 1798, and then later editions in the early years of the 1800s. Note that he predicted that there would be no rise of output per capita. Note that when he wrote his book was the start of the historical breakthrough to rising output per capita. 
you could say that his book is remarkably badly timed as a prediction because it's just when he wrote that the output per capita rose in an unprecedented way historically. Uh, this happens uh, to academics all the time. They predict the past, but they don't predict the future. Uh, and this was certainly the case uh, uh, with Malthus uh, in terms of what would follow Malthus's writings in the next two centuries. But Malthus is the pessimist. Now, uh, another idea starts the same way that higher technology leads to higher GDP per capita, but that higher income in this expanded theory leads to more saving and to more urbanization because with greater productivity in farming, as we know, fewer people can now farm for the whole country and the rest can work in urban industry and services. And then the idea is that urbanization tends to be associated with delayed marriage or marriage at a later age or with the use of contraception. And the result is that the population doesn't rise the same way as Malthus predicted, but the higher GDP per capita persists in a more urbanized environment. And this is the theory of exogenous growth. It's exogenous meaning that the higher technology isn't explained within this theory, it just happens somehow. It's just new Promethean knowledge, but its effect is a permanent rise of GDP per capita, not overwhelmed by population. And the difference with Malthus is really the idea that higher per capita income doesn't necessarily lead to an offsetting rise of population. If there are offsetting factors, uh, Malthus called them uh, the negative checks on population, like delaying marriage or the use of contraception, that means that the population doesn't increase as much. A third idea is that the higher technology leads to higher GDP per capita. It leads to more urbanization. More urbanization means more trade, but also more knowledge. That technology gives rise to more technology because people learn from the advances to produce still more advances. Technologies are combined or recombined or hybridized to produce yet new technologies. And societies begin to invest actively in the generation of innovations and invest through universities, through research and development, through industrial laboratories and so forth. So in this idea, higher technology leads to higher output per capita, which leads to more technology which leads to still higher GDP per capita. And in the process, the economy becomes more and more urbanized and richer and richer. And this is called endogenous growth. The reason it's called endogenous growth is that knowledge is creating more knowledge. So the technological advances are explained within the context of the economic system itself. Indeed, the technological advances are an economic output, not just a gift from above, but an economic output of investments in research and development. And that is a self-sustaining dynamic process. So these are three visions of uh, long-term development. Malthus and the Malthusian vision says that uh, humanity was or is condemned to life near subsistence level, because if it ever gets richer, the population expands and offsets the technological gain. 
the exogenous growth says you can get a one-time improvement from a one-time improvement of technology. And the endogenous growth idea is that higher techno technological know-how by itself, by creating a larger market, new knowledge, new income that can be devoted to R&D, and an expanded incentive for research and development gives rise to further technological change. One could say that the Malthusian trap seems to apply to the period before 1800 as a pretty good model. And one could say that the endogenous growth framework helps us to understand the period after 1800. It remains an intellectual puzzle of the first order, how the transformation from the Malthusian trap to endogenous growth actually occurred because for long periods of human history, there was not ongoing self-sustaining endogenous growth. But after 1800, that occurred at least for 200 years. There are uh, other points that should be added that are refinements to the comparison of these three different visions. For example, can population increase with the stable technology without depressing output per capita like Malthus predicts? And one answer is possibly you could have a growing population with stable technology and stable output per capita if, if uh, it's possible to accumulate machinery and other capital to offset the uh, decline of land area per person. So if the farms, uh, farmland per population gets smaller, but the machinery on the farms increases, the food output can be sustained and grow to accommodate the growing population. So one refinement of the Malthusian idea is that it's not only land that counts for limiting income per capita, but also the capital that is used, for example, in food production. There's another big question. It's our question for the 21st century. What happens if technology continues to improve and the human population continues to grow as is happening? And the question is, can living standards continue to rise? And will eventually there be ecological limits reached that stop further increases of well-being or that actually lead to ecological catastrophes? And we're, we will talk about that in uh, uh, two weeks from now when we talk about the planetary boundaries and limits to uh, economic growth. But the point is that even with rising technology that is raising output and feeding more and more people, the outcome is still uncertain if there are ecological barriers uh, that mean that the higher populations are undermining the sustainability of the ecosystems necessary for food production and for human survival. This past year, I published a book that tries to look at the long, long term of macroeconomics by considering the nature of technological change over a very long period of time. I call it the ages of globalization because I consider seven different periods of human history and the nature of the technological changes during those periods and relate those changes to these different visions of 
Malthusian, exogenous, and endogenous economic growth. And uh, you look at this later, you can't see it on the screen very clearly, but I described the seven ages of uh, globalization, their approximate dates, the primary energy used, the information technologies used, and so forth, and identify the main driving technological changes that occur in each of these uh, periods. So the oldest period of globalization is the period in which uh, humans spread out from Africa to inhabit all parts of the world in the uh, period before agriculture. Uh, so in, in the period of hunting and gathering uh, before, my, before human civilization began with uh, human settlements, uh, maybe the main technological advance was the development of human language. We don't know and we don't really understand uh, exactly uh, what happened uh, in prehistory uh, to enable this uh, remarkable habitation of uh, the, the, the planet. The breakthrough 10,000 years ago that was decisive was the invention or discovery of, uh, of agriculture which enabled uh, human settlements, the growth of food rather than the hunting and gathering of food and the rising population densities that came with that. The third era that I talk about comes with the domestication of the horse uh, around uh, 3000 BC or 5,000 years ago because the horse was essentially the automobile uh, of uh, the uh, earlier uh, human history. It was the only uh, way that humans could travel effectively over long distances uh, with all of the uh, improvements of transport, communication, uh, and military uh, force that came along with that. So horse-based uh, economies uh, were decisively advantaged relative to economies uh, where there was no domestication of the horse. Uh, the fourth uh, period is the classic age of empire. Probably the decisive invention of that period is the invention of the alphabet, uh, which enabled uh, breakthroughs of knowledge and communication uh, and scholarship uh, in the classic era. Uh, the next phase I talk about is transoceanic navigation especially with the voyages of Columbus and Vasco da Gama that connected Europe with the Americas and with Asia by ocean navigation. And then around 1800, the Industrial Revolution and the decisive breakthrough of the Industrial Revolution was the steam engine. And now I say we're in the seventh age of globalization where the decisive technologies are the digital technologies. And during this period, there were long-term macroeconomic changes, but the most decisive ones came with the industrial revolution and in our modern uh, digital era. And change has definitely accelerated dramatically during the last 200 years because technological advances have dramatically accelerated as knowledge generates more knowledge. And one of the huge changes is the change of how we work and live from societies where everybody was engaged in farming or nearly everybody to today's world in which uh, the proportion of the global workforce in agriculture is around one quarter and another 20 or so percent is working in industry and half or more of the population is working in services, something new for human history. And in this book, I 
suggest that these long-term changes need to be understood as a interaction and a fascinating interaction of the physical geography of economies, the institutional framework of those economies in terms of politics and culture and law and economic institutions, and the technological know-how of the societies in all of the major spheres. And it's the interaction of geography, technology, and institutions that determines the long-term changes of societies. One point that I think is important and fascinating is how much uh, the physical base of our societies has shaped long-term macroeconomics. And I've been fascinated for many decades by the interrelationship of climate and development. This is a map of climate zones in the world called the Kirpin Geiger, Geiger uh, climate classification map. And uh, broadly speaking, the green regions of the world are the temperate zone regions that we live in in New York, New York City, uh, that have uh, winters and summers, uh, basically four seasons. Uh, and uh, um, one can see that uh, the east coast of the United States uh, and the south of the US, all of Western Europe, most of China, uh, the east coast of Australia, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, southern part of Brazil and uh, Argentina uh, and the southern tip of Africa are the green or temperate zones. The blue uh, climate areas are the cold regions of the world with long cold winters and short growing seasons for crops. The uh, yellow or beige areas are the dryland regions of the world, the deserts. And the red zones of the world are the tropical equatorial zones where it's hot all year round uh, and there are no cool months. And for a lot of reasons related to crop productivity and disease, adequate rainfall, length of growing season, the green temperate zone regions of the world seem to have the best balance between agricultural productivity and low disease burden as a base for development. And uh, historians uh, of historical, uh, oops, economic development have uh, christened a band of latitude uh, where most of the green uh, temperate zones uh, lie as lucky latitudes that are favorable for economic development. And this includes the Mediterranean region and China, uh, a part of India uh, and so forth. And this band uh, has been the lucky band for long-term economic development for much of uh, human history. Another factor that has been important is having uh, horses. And one of the decisive differences of old world macroeconomic development, that is of Europe, Asia, and Africa on the one side, and of development in the Americas before 1492, before the oceanic connection between uh, the old world and the new world was that in the Americas, the horses, which were very prevalent uh, in the uh, Pleistocene before the end of the Ice Age, were driven to extinction around 10,000 years ago. And so for the long period of settlement and economics of the new world before the connections with Europe were made by Columbus's voyages in 1492, the native uh, 
American populations did not have the benefit of horses. In fact, the only large uh, domesticated uh, mammals were in a very narrow zone in the Andean region, the uh, Yama, uh, Lama populations uh, and alpacas, uh, which served for some uh, economic functions, but only in the Andean region. So most of the Americas were devoid of horses and devoid therefore of all of the uh, huge uh, benefits of horsepower and long distance transport that they made possible. Uh, and this means that the old world had a, an enormous development advantage compared to the, the new world for 10,000 years. And so it's right to think about the lucky latitudes in the old world, which didn't translate to similarly lucky latitudes in the new world during the period before all of the world was interconnected by ocean navigation. And from the earliest periods of history, most of the cities that developed in the world indicating early economic development took place in this narrow band of latitudes. This is uh, impressive because it tells us how early economic development was already uneven, strongly uneven because of natural economic conditions. And already uh, 2000 years ago, the main empires of the world at that time, such as the Roman empire or the Persian empire, which was the Parthian empire at the time, or the Chinese empire, which was the Han empire, all lie along that uh, horizontal band of favored latitudes, which benefit from the ecological conditions of that climate zone. And with the presence of horses, which greatly underpinned the economies the governments and the military power of these societies. This is a, a picture of the Roman Empire. And uh, as of uh, Hadrian's, Emperor Hadrian's uh, time, and uh, you can see that it was a temperate zone empire defined by growing wheat and olive oil. Uh, and so this was uh, a, um, the material base of uh, the Roman Empire was a plentiful food supply. Similarly, the Han Empire at the same time in China was largely a temperate zone rice growing empire, also with a northern uh, dryland uh, or steppe region uh, part of China. And much of China's history is the interplay between the steppes, the drylands of the north and the uh, temperate uh, humid zones where the rice is grown. Well, the world uh, did eventually interconnect through long distance ocean trade. China would have been the world leader in this because already uh, uh, almost a century before Columbus's voyages, China was making its own very long distance, remarkable ocean uh, voyages. But then the Ming Empire in China, the emperor and the Confucian bureaucrats uh, decided to stop the ocean-based trade, whereas uh, the European monarchs promoted ocean-based trade to find sea routes to Asia, uh, and Columbus ended up uh, landing in the Caribbean uh, and Vasco da Gama uh, made his voyage around Africa to Asia. So by the early 1500s, the world entered a new phase of long-term macroeconomics because now the whole world was interconnected uh, by uh, ocean uh, vessels. Of course, it was a it, it, it was uh, not a, an even battle uh, 
among the different regions of the world that ensued, but Europe was militarily more powerful than the rest of the world and also then engaged in colonization of the Americas and of imperialization of Asia and a massive uh, and a development of a capitalist based massive slave trade out of Africa. Uh, a, another story, but a fundamental part of long term economic development, one of the uh, lasting uh, crimes of uh, humanity. The macroeconomic breakthrough came uh, to industrialization with this technological advance, uh, the development over the course of the 18th century of the steam engine, because this invention was as fundamental, uh, even more fundamental than domesticating horses, because now you could have an iron horse, uh, the railroad. Uh, you could have horsepower through uh, steam power. Uh, the invention of the steam engine enabled an economy to harness energy at a scale that was previously unimaginable. Because before the steam engine, the only energy that could be harnessed was uh, animal traction, uh, like horses or oxen or human labor including slave labor, or the wind in sails, or the wind uh, and water in windmills or water mills. But the steam engine allowed for a massive expansion of the deployment of energy throughout the economy and made possible the uh, advent of mass mechanization and massive industrial production uh, in all sectors of the economy. And so the breakthrough that came with the steam engine was the breakthrough in technology that made all of those growth curves turn upward dramatically after 1800. Without this invention, there would not have been industrialization and there would not have been a period of modern economic growth and Malthus no doubt would have remained, uh, would have been the uh, most accurate uh, theorist of a stagnant economy. But it's because of this breakthrough and then subsequent waves of technological breakthrough that the output per capita in the world rose so dramatically after 1800. But from the point of view of macroeconomics, the crucial question is why did this breakthrough in know-how disseminate according to the patterns that it did? Why did industrialization for at least the first 150 years after the advent of the steam engine occur only in a small part of the world, whereas in most of the world, the old Malthusian subsistence agricultural economies persisted. So this is a graph using Madison's data of the GDP per capita estimated from 1820 until 2008 for different regions of the world. The orange curve at the top is the United States economy, which you can see uh, was equal to or the, above uh, all the other economies of the world uh, for most of uh, the last 200 years. The blue curve uh, that is intermingled with the U.S. and then falls below it from uh, the 1930s onward is the United Kingdom. Industrialization began in the United Kingdom 
And so the United Kingdom was richer than the rest of the world for a time. But by the end of the 19th century, the U.S. had caught up with Britain in output per capita and then soared ahead of Britain in the 20th century. The green line is very interesting because that's the only economy outside of Europe and the United States to industrialize already during the 19th century. And that is Japan, because Japan is the only Asian country to industrialize even partially in the second half of the 19th century. After a period of economic reforms that started in 1868 called the Meiji Restoration. And that is what enabled Japan to become the economic and military power of Asia from around 1890 to the end of World War II, uh, where Japan initiated the war in the Pacific region because of its military power, though in the end was defeated by the United States. Uh, the rest of the world, other than the US, Western Europe, and Japan, did not industrialize until the second half of the 20th century. The rest of the world you can see here includes Latin America, India, Africa, China. They're all poor, and they all remain with low levels of output per capita until the uh, most recent period. There's a glimmer of development in Latin America, mainly uh, through various commodity booms that occurred uh, at the end of uh, the uh, 19th century. But by and large, Latin America, Africa, and Asia, other than Japan, remained poor. This is one of the big questions and mysteries of economic development. And there are many theories about it. What prevented most of the non-North Atlantic world, that means other than the US and Europe, from developing until after 1950? My own view is that this resulted generally from two considerations. One was that they lacked political sovereignty. So most of the non-North Atlantic world was either directly under the imperial control of Europe, such as India, or largely under the political control, uh, such as uh, coastal China, or effectively under the political control uh, of Europe, such as parts of South America. Also, these other regions generally lacked coal, which was crucial to deploy steam power. Britain was lucky not only to have the inventor of the steam engine, James Watt, but also to have ample coal supplies. That's what uh, induced him to invent the steam engine also, was that there was coal to be deployed as a primary energy source. And he, based on earlier versions of the steam engine, worked out how to do that. So Britain's industrialization and then America's subsequent industrialization was based on technological know-how, political sovereignty, and a lot of coal. And that's what the three contributed to the very different patterns of economic development. Well. The result of industrialization uh, is that uh, Asia fell far behind Western Europe in the 19th century. Indeed, India became a colony, or a, uh, I should say, uh, a, a part of the uh, imperial uh, possessions of the British Empire, and China succumbed to 
many wars of European powers, starting with the first and second opium wars, uh, and then the uh, imperial uh, rule of coastal China at the end of the 19th century. So Asia's share of the world population, uh, I'm sorry, the world's uh, economic output fell very, very sharply during the period of modern economic growth between 1820 and the middle of the last century, around 1950. I find this curve interesting. It shows the proportion of world output that is due to Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And it is about uh, two thirds of world output as of 1820 in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, mainly in Asia, because roughly two thirds of the world population live in those countries. But by 1945, at the end of World War II, the share of world output produced by Asia, Latin America, and Africa had declined to only 30%. And the reason is that the output of Europe and the United States expanded so dramatically that those two regions came to dominate the world economy. Now, after 1950, you can see that the share of world output produced in Asia, Latin America, and Africa has begun to rise again. So we're seeing a U-shaped curve. Think about that as the rise of China, but not only China, because Korea, Japan, uh, other parts of Asia, now India, uh, and to some extent Africa and Latin America also experienced a rise of output after 1950. What changed? What led to a reversal of uh, this downward trend? If I had to give one uh, main factor, I would say it was the end of the age of European imperialism that ended after World War II. Because when India and China and Africa gained political independence, and also countries in Southeast Asia and in uh, the Caribbean and in uh, South America gained effective control over their economic futures. For the first time in the modern period, they were able to undertake the long-term investments in knowledge, education, skill development, infrastructure in order to take advantage of the technological know-how to raise output per capita. And so my view is that this period of modern economic growth can therefore be divided into two phases, the period from 1800 to 1950 was the phase of European domination and the phase from 1950 until today is the phase of catching up that is occurring in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and other parts of the developing world. This is very relevant for our understanding of the rise of China today, which is in the news every day. And many American politicians view China as some kind of evil enemy of the United States, which is a falsehood. What is happening is that China is regaining its relative economic position in the world as not an impoverished country, but as a normal economy after a long period of decline. And so what we're seeing in the rise of China is what we're seeing more generally in the world. And that is that the dominance in output per capita that uh, came with industrialization to the countries of Europe and the United States is now spreading 
to the rest of the world, something that I regard as very, very positive because it means that economic well-being is also spreading to more of the world. And I say more, <laughs> there's another more here, uh, and that is Moore's Law. Uh, that is the uh, technological advance of the digital technologies. Moore's Law, as you know, is uh, a measure of the uh, capacity of microprocessors or transistor circuitry uh, in computers. And Moore's Law has uh, said that the computing power measured in various ways has tended to double and double and double every couple of years since the 1960s. And uh, it is that technological advance also that is fueling the economic development of China and other poorer countries that are now experiencing a rise of output per capita. In other words, they are benefiting not only from the end of the colonial era, but also the surge of technological know-how, especially in the digital technologies that allow for rapid economic growth. And one of the dramatic features of this is that if we look at the total output of China and the United States, we see a, a crossing of the paths. The US used to be a much larger economy than China just 40 years ago. But as of today, China is a larger economy than the United States. If we measure the size of the economy in purchasing power parity prices. This doesn't mean that China is as rich per capita as the US because China, remember, has a population that is four times larger than the US. China's output per capita is roughly one third of the US output per person. But because the population is four times larger, the total output is roughly four thirds of the United States or 30% higher if measured at purchasing power prices. Another point that is important is that as part of the catching up of China after the long period of decline, China is now investing more and more in research and development, R&D. This is important because as I've been emphasizing throughout the whole lecture, knowledge is the most fundamental driver of rising output per capita. And China uh, 40 years ago was very poor and also investing very little in innovation. But China now is investing more and more in innovation. That again scares many US politicians, though I find it not only normal, but desirable for the world because China will develop lots of good new technologies that will be a benefit for the entire world, I believe. Uh, and this rise of R&D means that China's endogenous growth is now uh, a major fact for the world economy. Now, let me just uh, highlight uh, quickly a huge problem in all of this. We have been now more than two centuries in endogenous growth, rising technology, enabling more food production, rising populations, rising output, so that total output in the world is 100 times or more higher than 200 years ago. And technology has been able to keep ahead of the population growth to promote a rise of not only output, but output per person. And in many cases, because the rise of output per person has been associated with urbanization, that has led to a decline of 
fertility rates, uh, a decline of uh, birth rates, that is. And the result is that populations have tended to stabilize so that output per person has risen uh, directly without uh, an offset of rising population. On the whole, this would all seem to be beneficial, except for the fact that the total output is now so large and the economic impacts of human beings on the planet are now so costly in terms of uh, declines of biodiversity, pollution, climate change, and the emergence of new diseases like COVID-19, that it is right to say that we're hitting limits to this traditional kind of economic growth. And one way that this is phrased is that we are hitting boundaries or planetary boundaries that will limit even uh, dramatically endanger our well-being. And so the challenge now is to combine the progress and benefits of technological advancement with the stewardship and sustainability of nature. That will be the topic in two weeks when we talk about sustainable development and specifically the goals that the world has set but not yet achieved to uh, secure sustainable development during this period of tremendous technological advancement, but also increasing dangers for the Earth's ecosystems. So just to summarize, long-term macroeconomic development is the story of long-term economic change driven fundamentally over the course of the last 10,000 years by knowledge, by the advancement of knowledge. The advancement of knowledge sets off so many chains of effect on population, on uh, the distribution of output and work in the economy, on where and how people live. The most decisive advances came with the acceleration of scientific knowledge and the development especially of steam power that unleashed the industrial revolution. For 150 years, that was a process that favored a small part of the world, our own, the North Atlantic region, which got very rich and very powerful compared to the rest of the world. Fortunately, now those benefits are spreading to the rest of the world as well, but they're raising this additional uh, very uh, important complication, how to combine the increased material production with environmental sustainability. Uh, and that is a, a core challenge of macroeconomics uh, that we will be discussing in the coming uh, two weeks of, uh, of the course. So let me stop there and uh, look forward to uh, seeing everybody next week. Thank Thanks, you. Professor. Have a good week. Thank you. you too. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. See you on Friday. Thank you, Professor.